Welcome to the Tuka Talks show, where Tuka Tech founder Ram Serene talks to fellow fashion industry experts about the trending topics of today, the history of the apparel business, and the paradigm shifts that will transform the industry for the future. Greetings from Tuka Talks. Denim. Some of you wear them. Some of you are challenged by the way denim is made. Some of you are fighting how things can be done better in the denim industry. I'm very fortunate to have a veteran, a pioneer of this industry, Paul Gaz. For those of you who don't know Paul Gaz, you don't know denim. Paul, it's a pleasure to have you on Tuka Talks. A pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Tell me um, a little bit about your background. I am born many, many years ago in Tunisia, North Africa. When I was 19, I moved from Tunisia to France where I stayed 13 years, and then I came to the U.S., and I am here since I came, 1975. And what brought you into denim business? Now, we all know denim was a workwear or um, rugged 16-ounce, 14-ounce um, H.D. Lee and Levi's were their big names. Nobody had heard of premium denim. You were the pioneers of the premium denim. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your journey on that. It started... One day I was in Lyon, France, and a friend of mine asked me to borrow $20,000. So I said, sure. He said, I'll pay you back in 90 days. I said, okay. Then, you know, 85 days passed by, and he calls me and he said, I cannot pay you. I said, okay, no problem. You pay me when you can. He said, no, I cannot pay you, but I want to pay you. I said, oh, okay. So you have to explain that one to me. He said, well, I want to pay you in jeans. Okay. So he sent me $20,000 worth of jeans. He said, you are young, you know everybody, you can try the jeans on all the girls. They'll go to the nightclub with the jeans. And at that time, it was a fashion jean, you know, always a French jean. So I tried to give as many jeans as uh, I could to uh, young girls. I was, I was young, very young myself. And exactly what he said, in the nightclubs, you know, the owners of the boutiques, they will see those girls with the jeans and say, where did you get them? I say, from Paul. So they will come to me, and I sold the first $20,000 easily, like very fast. So I call him, I say, listen, how about 40000 yeah. <laughs> he said, sure. So I sent him 40,000. He sent me the jeans. I sell them very well, very fast. And I call him and I say, how about 80? He said, no problem, but it's the last time. I said, what do you mean the last time? He said, it's the last time because there is no more denim in the world. The only country that is producing denim in 1975 was the U.S. And at that time, Levi's bought all the denim from all the factories, or that's what I heard. So I said, I'll go to the U.S. He said, you don't even speak English. I said, yeah, don't worry about that. And I came to the U.S. So I was in New York. I found a lot of jobbers. 
I had a contract with Dan River, very fast. Yeah. And they gave me a lot of denim. And all of a sudden, you know, I became the denim guy. And then I meet this young designer called Maurice Sassoon, who came to ask me for 200 yards. I say, how about we get in business the right way and make like a few thousand? He said, you crazy, a few thousand? I said, no, 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 that's what we have to do. So we start with a small order in that I placed with a friend of mine in El Paso, Texas, called Jim Viola. So I ordered from Jim 600, you know? And he said, I will ship you in a few weeks. And I went to my uh, doorman. I gave him 100 bucks. I said, listen, I have a, a truck coming with some jeans. Put them in the basement and we will move them. No problem. So, and one morning, somebody was knocking on my door. It was a huge Texan driver. Said, if you don't come and pick up your jeans now. I said, but I spoke with the doorman and uh, he said, no problem. Say, I know. He told me. But he didn't know it was 600 dozens. <laughs> I thought, I thought it was 600 pieces. In France, we think pieces. The guy from Texas thought yeah, it was. So he said, instead of 600 pieces, 7,200 pieces. Wow. So, yeah. That's how we start having some inventory. And uh, we sold to a lot of boutiques. Then one, do, one day we go and see Bloomingdale. She knows about the jeans because all around her, every boutique had the Sassoon jeans. So when we went to see her, she knew already the existence of that brand. And uh, my salesman was with her, and uh, all of a sudden he calls me, say, they want you here. They want to buy, but there is some conditions. I said, okay, I'm on my way. So I go there. Two ladies. One is Nanette Rika, and the other one is jo Johansson. And uh, they say, okay, we are going to buy your jeans. We know you have a few thousand pieces. We are going to take 2,400 pieces. Today is Thursday. We are going to pick them up tomorrow for the weekend. And Monday we will know. But this is the deal. If we sell, we'll come and pick up the rest of what you have in inventory. If we don't sell, we'll ship them back to you. I said, OK. And one more thing they said. I said, what? We need one page on the New York Times about Sassoon jeans and take a picture and show the in Bloomingdale. In Bloomingdale. They called me on Monday morning. They say, OK, we are coming to pick up the, Rest of the, the balance. Yeah. And they came with six checkers. You know those big taxis, old big taxis yeah. in New York? Yeah. Yeah, they filled them up and they left. They went to 59th Street. They put the goods, they put, I'm sure, the goods in uh, a lot of different stores. And uh, the rest is history. No, Sassoon was a name. Yeah. Um, I think it was selling four times, five times what Levi's was selling at that time. Cost-wise, yes. Levi's, I think, at that time was at nine ninety nine. Something like that. Yeah, we were at thirty six and thirty eight dollar retail. Wow. Which was a big deal at that time. Of course. Yeah. This is the mid seventies. Yeah, mid seventies, and at that time. The French jeans, they were selling at $75 and $85. Sassoon jeans were a copy of the McKean jeans, which were selling at 85 And we had the, exactly the same jean made in USA. They were costing me at that time six fifty. Wow. The whole jean. We were selling them at 
$16.99 and $17.99 and uh, for a $38 retail. And uh, we blew out. The journey opened up a lot of doors for others. It motivated a lot of people because what you did was so not imaginable by the big boys. But collectively, a lot of small boys came in who became really big. Denim. Whoa, whoa, in your peak days, how many jeans were you making a week? A lot. We were making a lot of jeans. We started with uh, El Paso, Texas. Then we produced here in Los Angeles. Then we produced in uh, Hong Kong, China, a lot. The total Sassoon company at one time, and Mexico, of course. The total Sassoon company at one time was doing around $800 million at retail. And that will bring us to another story that we had one day this guy called Leo Gore. He is the father of Leslie Gore. And he was in the licensing business. And he tells me, very nice meeting you. I would like to introduce you to a possible deal, you taking the license of Oscar de la Ranta. I said, taking the license for what? He said, for jeans. I said, so you want me to make jeans for Oscar de la Ranta, really? Are you serious? He said, yeah, he's a brand. I said, we are a brand too. I said, okay, listen, I like you. We are going to go outside. We are going to walk, you and I. And we are going to ask people who they know better, Sassoon or Oscar de Laurenta. If you win, I'll take the license. If I win, you work for me. He said, doing what? I said, licensing Sassoon. He said, okay, deal. We go, and I think we beat Oscar 8-2 or 9-1. And he starts working with me. And in a very short time, we had about 160 licensees worldwide. Japan, Mexico, France, you know, Europe, everywhere. South Africa, Australia. Wow. It was crazy. Uh, Only jeans or other products? Everything. Everything. In the U.S. alone, we had about 20 licenses. Children's clothing. Everything. Yeah. Suits for men. Yeah. Shirts. And a lot of companies, you know, uh, needed a boost of a brand. And uh, they, when they started doing business with Sassoon, their business. At one time, I was going with all my licenses to all the department stores and present the whole thing. And everybody will be selling to the department stores, including men's suits. You know, like one of the companies that was doing men's shirt, Paul Davril, was like a small company. As soon as they took Sassoon, they... They became very big. Yeah. You also had other brands that you manufactured. You had licenses. Antique denim. We had Taveniti, Sojin. We had Yanuk jeans. And which one do you have now? Right now, I am with my brother Gerard, and uh, we have 11 brands. And the one I'm taking care of is uh, Current Elliot. And the CEO of Current Elliot, yeah. What are the other brands in the denim? Your brothers within your family? We have the Seven, the Seven, Seven, Seven. seven. Uh-huh. It's a nice yeah. brand. Yeah, very nice brand. A lot of business at uh, medium price. Then we have uh, NYDJ. Oh, not your daughter's jeans. Not your daughter's jeans. You know, it's amazing that not your daughter's jeans. George Rudis was one of the guys who sold me denim in 1976. 
He was a jobber in New York. And one day, I asked him to give me all his merchandise. He said, why would I do that? I said, because I'll put you in the gin business. And he said, you are going to put me in the gin business? I said, yeah. Right now, we're in the fabric business. I'll put you in the gin business. And he sent me his nephew, a young man called Jeff Rudis. Wow. Who made Jay Brown. Yes. I gave Jeff his first job and his last, last job before he created uh, Jay Brand. And George created Not Your Daughter Jeans. And now it's a part of the 11 brands that uh, Gerard owns with K. Los Angeles has been branded as the mecca of premium denim. Exactly. Even the Europeans came here. Um, I remember diesel jeans making in Los Angeles because they wanted to sell $1,000 jeans. Whether they sold many or any, that's a separate ball game. But the perception in the market was these are almost like handmade, starting from special fabrics and special treatments and so on. And that kind of crowded the market where it became very confusing for the buyer, which one is a brand to have today. Um, yeah, I don't think today you have a any of those brands selling for more than $200 jeans, unless I'm wrong. No, you're right. <clears throat> the pressure from the environmentalists, the pressure from not just NGOs in manufacturing countries, but all people, even people who don't make it, they are buyers. Even now, they are looking at how is denim being made? What is the environmental impact? What do you have to say about that? I'm saying that sooner or later, everything will be, you know, completely safe. And that even the wash with the lasers I am sure we are going to invent like things that can ev make everything look like washed and even looking even better than washed. And uh, that will be eventually the end of uh, the laundries. So the waterless. Yes. The laundries in LA are probably one of the most advanced. Uh, in the world. And what's funny is that even people that were very, very famous and very strong outside of Los Angeles felt like they had to come and establish laundries in a day. Yes, that is true. As a matter of fact, I've met a few of your friends, um, old timers, um, I'm in my 70s. Uh, yeah, me too. Um, I just have people... a, little, a, little bit, <laughs> a little bit more hair than you. <laughs> I lost that when I was in 50s. So It's okay. Uh, the experience, the conversation that I have with our age group, people who've had 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the business, almost everyone is very hopeful for technology to do the savior part. Um, as you said, the laser technology bypasses all the physical processes that we were doing in creating the same look that we would have got either with a stone wash or a whiskers or brushing or washing or acids and all that had to go back into the environment somewhere or the other. And now I can create that look. 
But this denim industry has been challenged by the yoga wear, the athletic wear that they call it, um, athleisure wear. And somebody took that technology that we've created for creating laser ready artwork but take that into the printing on lycra base and make actually the garment which looks like a waistband pocket but it's only artwork right underneath there a woman can actually stretch it out and wear it on a daily basis. How effective is that as far as A, the cost, B, the sustainability of this business, or should the denim people be a little more careful today who have been sitting in their own cocoon with a five-pocket jean maker and that's what I'm going to stay as. Should they be pivoting to the new business models? I think they are. One thing for sure, all the athleisure clothing that you see and all the attraction, that will never stop the denim business. You know, we designed the first collection of American Eagle jeans. I know Jay Shredden seen very well, and I knew his father before him. And we created that collection of denim, and one of his president at that time said, I will take the denim out of the store for a few months when it's not the season. And I told him, listen to me, you're not going to take anything out of the store. And I, we had a conversation with this boss. Say, that's the most stupid thing I ever see, heard in my life. I'm not going to say names because the guy is still alive. But uh, you can see the business of Levi's, American Eagle, Gap, all those guys. The denim business is the denim business. It's going to change a little bit. The washes are going to be different. They are going to create tons of new items for many other differences. But the denim is here forever. Forever. The innovation in denim. Yeah, that's good. Is that going to be in the fabrics itself or in the finishes? For example, the Lycra company uh, started out with two-way stretch and then a four-way stretch and it kind of helped a lot of people to make sure that a little bit of fit issues are compensated by the stretch a little. Um, how much of a role they are playing in making denim success? Huge. Huge. I think there is a, a combination of effort between the people who are creating the fabric and the people who are creating new washes with less water and less chemicals, obviously, and everything. And you have, like, huge companies, I know you know all of them, that are making fabrics that are absolutely unbelievable. And the fabric helps a lot, the feet. And the composition of the fabrics is very, very important, too, between all those new fibers the lyocell, the tencel, the hemp, the linen, uh, the lycra, of course. All those different combinations and all the progress that we went from a 100% cotton fabric to what it is today, which is mind-boggling. It is. And it's not just the Americans. I don't think there is a denim company in America anyway. Maybe one. But everybody, the Turkish, the Italians, the Pakistanis, the Chinese, the Europeans, 
they are all are going, maybe they're spying on each other, I don't know, but they're all coming up with beautiful fabrics, with beautiful blends, and taking care of the environment. Everything is less dye, less water, less, 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 everything is less. That brings me to another point, um, because if you look at from old days, uh, denim was rugged, um, 14 and three quarter ounce, 16 and a half ounce. Nobody had heard of nine ounce or 12 ounce or, or six seven ounce. ounce or five ounce. Five ounce denim. No, it's, 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 it's not a joke. There are designers who are looking to create A, the comfort, B, the fit, C, the look, or A, the look, B, the comfort. Price becomes almost like a last priority because if it really looks good, if it fits good, anyone who can afford it will buy that. Um, I see a, a major disconnect, and I mean this in a most sincere way, uh, at the factory level today. The factories don't know how to handle those fabrics, how to manufacture with those fabrics. The designers may have thought of doing something, but every fabric, especially the new fabric, there has to be adjustments made in the patterns to be able to handle, and how we spread it, how we cut it, how, how we, we let it rest. It. Yes. Yeah. And all of that nonsense that nobody's teaching. This is more of a hit and miss. But then you go into one country, they are doing it differently than the other country. But in each country, everybody is doing the same way because they all share information. Right. They move or copy each, each other, yeah. What do you think should be done as far as the training the factories, knowledge share? Well, all this know-how and all this technology and all the machines that have been created to answer, you know, how to cut or how to fit all those new fabrics into jeans and make them look good, there is a combination between the creativity on the fabrics part of it and the technology on all the new machines to cut, to spread, and spread, you know? So the, and nobody better than you can, no, can say that. It's, it's, um, we took the um, task, responsibility, uh, risk to stand out and say, no, let me show you the right way of doing it. Who should take that responsibility? The brand, the buying house, the sourcing company, the mill? Who should do that? It's amazing that you asked the question. I believe that you are an unbelievable guy, Thank that you. what you are doing for the industry is really commendable. And the way I see it is at one time, the technology between the fabric maker, the gene maker, the machine maker, are going to have like a kind of understanding where this one is going to create a great fabric with certain blends and is going to have like a mode d'emploi, like how to use my fabric. Correct. Okay? And uh, you are going to have all the machine for the different fabrics and you are going to tell them how to do it and, and help them. The fashion industry colleges have to start taking manufacturing as a course, not just designing 
today, a 12-year-old girl can sit down on Adobe Illustrator or they have kids program for designing dolls clothing. My nine-year-old granddaughter sat down and made on a 3D garment and she did a complete line with one of my engineers here. Even she could see what is this red? That means the fit is not right. You need to put some more fabric. A nine-year-old. So we know technology is helping in certain areas. And yes, the fashion schools are playing a role. But they're failing in teaching how to manufacture. The designers have missed it today. Most of these designers don't even know what a sewing machine, what a pattern making is. By sketching, that is not there. And then these technical designers have no idea of a manufacturing process. I am sad to say FIT in New York took out pattern making classes, making people become technical designers who wouldn't understand how the garment must be constructed. I've seen garments without any ease to be able to go through. How? How are you going to get it through your body? <clears throat> they, they, there is no understanding. And who gets hurt? The vendor, the developer, factory people. They have to make and remake and remake samples and samples. Those days are history. We have to get it right the first time. And every sample that you make should be able to sell at the full price. 98% loss of products wasted in samples. Did you know that? Yeah. I didn't know the percentage. 98 But I know how much it costs to make samples. And if there is a way that instead of sending to Egypt, Pakistan, Tunisia, Morocco, anywhere, tech packs to make samples there that you fit here and send the corrections and another FedEx and another two weeks. And if what you are saying about we can make perfect samples the first time and that sample can be shown as, well, this has to be advertised because you can have all the companies in the U.S., adhere to what you are preaching. Sadly, it was the Americans who decided they don't want to do this. It was technology was there. Look, I mean, I, I am not a fan of Paul Sharon. You remember Paul Sharon. He was the CEO of Liz Claiborne. He and I are not friends. Um, I feel that he was at a position where he was the influencer to the rest of the industry. So when you are a leader, it is your responsibility to guide them to the light, not to the dark, because they are following you. One day he wakes up, he says, okay, I'll give you a check and a sketch, or I'll give you a photo, you make the proto. And he shut down the entire Sea Caucus product development. The same department where Designers were talking to pattern makers who had sample sewers. They had data. They had information. You could just walk up to the pattern maker. Hey, Sally, remember we made this for such and such? I saw exactly the same with these changes. No tech pack. I am talking to my design room. She understood what you're talking about. She pulled out the pattern of that style, made the changes, cut the garment, sewed the garment. Two o'clock, three o'clock, we're fitting. Oh, we're done with that. Today is taking three weeks to six weeks to eight weeks. Yeah. Why? It's because we were too damn lazy and we or do not, did we not don't understand. Know. Or we don't know. No, we did not understand the impact. Look. Somebody asked me the other day, how does China know? Because when, when you look at companies like Sheen and Temu, and there are about 
10 dozen companies who are selling through Amazon direct to consumer, their clothes fit perfectly. Their prices are one-fourth or one-fifth of the retail prices, and yet they are making a lot of money. Why? Because they're selling direct to consumer. They found a loophole. But where did they get the technical know-how? We taught them. In early 70s, 80s, we were teaching Asians how to manufacture the American way. I, I made my fortune by setting up factories in Asia for American companies. But today, we've given them the entire IP. Oh, this is for Nordstrom. This is going to be sold at 149. This is going to be the fit. These are the sizes. These are the measurements. This is the fabric. Every possible thing is given to the supplier. They have the technical know-how. They have all the inside information. They say, if I am going to get only $12 and you're selling for $149, I got it. And they came back fully prepared and gave it to you. And you don't even know where the daggers are going. And the Americans are going, hello. What happened? What happened? (laughs) Shit happened, man. And you're responsible. Get up. Take charge. And make it happen. Because you know what? This is why we said fashion industry is a little secret here. These are my patterns. This is my fit. And then we went out and gave the whole thing to the Chinese. And then we wonder why they are successful. We give them much more than clothing uh, secrets. Beside denim, there are so many denim-friendly categories. A lot of people think denim is just five-pocket jeans. But there are so many things happening in the denim world. Um, What advice would you have for designers as far as pivoting their thinking process or be a little more creative as far as the use of that fabric or use of that look is concerned? Well, you know, you have the basic five-pocket jean which will stay here forever. Then now, between the new fabrics and the new constructions and the new feeling of those fabrics, you can create a lot of different shapes for jeans. And uh, it's not just the five pocket is going to be there forever. Correct. But there is now the wide legs and the skinny, skinny legs, the stiletto. I mean, there is so many. You, you, you can see also people creating styles that you say, oh, my God, well, I can't believe that, you know? So the advice for a young designer is to be as creative as possible and understand what's happening in this world, looking at all those new fabrics and try to create, with those new fabrics, new bodies. From the fit perspective, the fit is from waist to crotch. That area. Right. Rest is style lines. How yeah. close I want to be to the knee and the thigh. Yeah. How far away do I want to be? Right. How long do I want to be? How much of a leg opening do I want? How much of a flare I want? That has nothing to do with fit. It's only the look. Denim industry is all about fit. If it fits, it sells. Yeah. Especially in the moments. Their bodies are different. One has to understand. And then comes a 24-year-old kid who had no idea on the garment business, whose parents were not in the garment business. He was no different than any other consumer who was very dissatisfied with the fit, his fit. And he talks to his girlfriend who had the equal sentiment. Long, long story short, 
they decided they want to make a made-to-measure denim company. Forget about making one type of body but making every possible body. Who goes to a made-to-measure? People who don't fit off the rack. I am one of those people. Why would somebody at age 24 go out and venture? Because nobody told him. You know what my slogan is? I didn't know it couldn't be done, so I did it. Right. Sometimes it's the mental block where we think that's the way it is done. The habit. Yes. Yeah. I'm very um, motivated to change that paradigm to let people, the younger people know it's all about attitude and aptitude. If your attitude is, I can do it, there are so many ways that we can do that. Both of us have something called experience. Right. I, my definition of experience is learning what not to do. Right. And that learning sometimes costs a lifetime earnings. Right. I've gone out of business because they didn't have the experience or that learning. Right. You and I have had a lot of investment made in our learnings. Right. Based on that investment, what would you tell the young people today what not to do in denim business? The business is becoming so difficult and so different. And so, you know, there is different markets. You have the market at $14.99, $19.99. Then you have $39, $49, $59. Then you have the market for 200 bucks. So for a newcomer in the gin business, <laughs> one of the things we tell him, what to do is to go to work for one year or two years for a good company and learn. Uh, you have to have a very good designer. You have to have a very good eye. But you also have to have an idea of how you are going to market your product. 30 and 40 years ago, we went on TV with the Setsun jeans. We like superstars like Elton John, like the Rangers. I remember those commercials. Yeah, you can still see them on YouTube. Wow. Yeah. So marketing is very, very important. Working with the best meals because you will have the best fabrics and that will help you have the most beautiful jeans. That's very, very important. So the price first. Decide what price range. Where, what market you are going to be attacking. Yes. You know? And then plan accordingly. To, yeah, today, the same gene made in Turkey or made in USA or made in Pakistan or made in China, same one. You'll have four different prices. And you are not sure which one is going to be the cheaper and good. And personally, I really feel that Pakistan made like a huge effort in our industry where they can give you prices that are basically unbeatable. Maybe by Bangladesh, they can be the same. But Pakistani factories are doing unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a strong believer. Yeah, me too. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks for listening to this discussion presented by Tuka Talks. If you found something in this conversation insightful, we would love for you to click the share button and send this episode to a friend. 